It's Monday, June 20th, and this is Drive Check, a Card Fight Vanguard podcast. Yeah. I have a, a special but, treat for you guys. If you're, oh, yeah? If you're done with your conversation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I bought seven packs at Third Eye Games on Sunday, and I saved opening them from yesterday all the way through all of today to just now so that you guys can witness me pulling some form of a Glendios. I got... Um, <laughs> Two packs of Binding Force of the Black Rings and five packs of Infinite Rebirth. So you ready for this? Oh, yeah. Ready for that pack, Crinkle. There you go. Uh, I got a, ooh, Singularity Sniper. That's garbage. Gamma Burst Fenrir. No good. Uh, Pick Gall. Star Vader Moon Commander, which I didn't have. A nice stand trigger. And a Liberator Bagpipe Angel. Well, there were some Link Jokers in that one I didn't have before. So, that's not too bad. All right, pack two. You ready? Yes. All right, we got a tightrope tumbler for Pale Moon. A Demon World Castle Ser Schlangen. No good. Amon's Follower Hell's Deal. Nope. Amon's Follower Hell's Trick. Nope. Fire Ring Griffin. There was literally no cards in that entire pack for me. That's fine. We're done with... Finding Force of the Black Rings, and we're moving on to Infinite Rebirth. Okay, what do we got here? Sharp Point Revenger, Shadow Lancer, Misdirection. Why am I getting all these Pale Moons? Machining Black Soldier. Does anybody play Mega Colony? Dragon Dancer, Therese, and Blue Storm Battle Princess, Krista Elizabeth. No, I don't want Aqua Force. Now, this is not looking good. My last pack's going to have that Glendios in it, though. I can tell. Ooh, here's a Link Joker. Planet Collapse Star Vader Erbium. Hmm. Uh, Machining Papilio. Demonic Dra- Dragon Berserker Hoken Yasha. There's a lot of Kagero here. Machining Scorpion. Ooh, and a Blue Storm Guardian Dragon Icefall Dragon. That's an Ar- uh, Aqua Force Perfect Guard. Do we know anybody who plays Aqua Force? Uh, I don't. <laughs> I do not either. Oh, well. Maybe they'll come back is in that, that fashion. Are we sure that's a perfect guard, or is it a quintet wall? Oh, it may have been a quintet wall. Uh, where did I throw it so carelessly? Because I did not care for it. Uh... When this unit is placed on the guard circle from hand, if you have an Aqua Force Vanguard, you may pay the cost. If you do, reveal five cards from the top of your deck. That is a quintet wall. Even worse. All right, let's see. Mastigal, Gold Paladin, Machining Caucasus, Violence Horn Dragon, uh, Star Vader Spark Doll, that's a Link Joker, and a Machining Red Soldier. Wow, these, these uh, Mega Colonies are going right in the trash. All right, we got two more packs left. <laughs> I'm sharing my pack opening high with everybody on the on the internet. All right. Physical Force Liberator Zoran. No bueno. Oh, that one's a good one for a gold paladin deck. All right, I'll send it to uh, Alan. Demon World Castle Sturmon Griff. Negligible Hydra. That's a Link Joker. Interesting art there. Uh, machining Cicada. And a Machining Locust. Ugh. Why so many Mega Colonies? This is more like a pack opening downer. <laughs> it's the last one. I see some sparkle in the back there. I see a lot of sparkle oh in the back there. All right. Imaginary Orthos. That's a nice Link Joker. Eternal Bringer Griffin for Kagero. Wyvern Strike Jet Kagero. Uh, machining Bombix Mega Colony. Oh, well, it wasn't what I wanted, but it's still a triple rare. <laughs> I am not unhappy. Star Vader Reverse Cradle. Nice. Ooh. It is. Ooh, the, you do uh, you do need that for Glendio decks, though. Yeah, it's it's uh it's the reverse Star Vader card. Yeah, that's that's played. 
and uh yeah you definitely play that that's one of the better reverse units nice <sighs> yeah so uh, obviously i uh played a little vanguard on sunday um met up with my bff joe we went out to third eye games we actually went for a dice masters uh i guess it's kind of like a pre-release or a draft um i did terrible at that i'm real bad at dice masters but uh, then afterwards, we played some Vanguard, and then I paid my tax on leaving the store and bought those seven packs of cards uh, for way too much money. But I don't know. I don't. I'm happy I got that reverse card. Uh, so, Jack, did you play any Vanguard recently? That's all you've been doing since you graduated from high school, and you're a real adult now, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, forego all responsibilities and play children's card games for sure. Um, I played a little bit. Saturday and Sunday. Did I play Saturday? Yes, I played Saturday and Sunday. I played, uh, I got to, uh, test out some of the new Kagura cards and I finally got to, uh, break in my new, uh, no seal deck that I just finished. Except so those were, uh, perfect guard I still have to send you, which I'll probably get in the mail. Tomorrow. Well, yeah, I just used a proxy. Uh-huh. And, um, so, and then, but I mean, that deck is playable now for the first time and then i was testing out a lot of the new the new kagura support which let me tell you those uh those new cards that i just added to the deck make the deck really uh annoying to play against because every time um basically i have like eight cards in my deck that when the opponent attacks i can get rid of the attacker so i can do it really often and it's really annoying to play against so you can retire the attacker during the opponent's turn yeah nice so it's really it's a really fun because it's like you don't really get to do much in this game on your opponent's turn and uh this deck changes all that yeah i noticed that the g guardian does uh, retire the attacker yeah the g guardian denial griffin is really good and then you also have so your four heal triggers uh retire during the opponent's turn and then there's a i forget what the the other card is called but it's a grade one it's a generation break one, and then it's after you guard with this card. If the attack doesn't hit, you choose one of your opponent's rear guards at rest and retire it. Nice. So that's also a really good card. And then, so you basically, the deck is kind of set up to uh, do a lot of the retiring on your opponent's turn. So I finished that deck for the most part. I'm still waiting on a couple of cards. Um, but other than that, that deck is done. And so. I tested those two decks a lot, and the those two are really fun to play. So, oh, yeah. Re- remind me when we're done. I have a question on Blink Messiah, but I don't want to bore people with that right now. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I just want both of your opinion on it. Cole, did, have, what have you played re- recently? Um, <clears throat> I met up with a buddy of mine from high school Friday, and we played a lot of uh, Weiss Schwartz, and I taught him how to play Vanguard again, and he whooped me when I was testing out my Super Cosmic Heroes, and then I destroyed him with my Grand Blue, which was reassuring to me, because no matter, he's just a natural at card games, so it's kind of hard to beat him even if he just picks up a game. Um, and then Saturday, I played with a bunch of my friends at the game shop. There's four people total, including me, showed up because of Origins in Ohio, which is only like a t- two, three hour drive away. So everyone did the team league there. I can't wait to hear those stories uh, Saturday if I go. But yeah, I had a real chill time. My Cosmic Heroes need a lot of work. They're not working out very well for me, but uh, Grand Blue is still a ton of fun to play. And I got absolutely destroyed by a uh, the same Gurdwood deck. But uh, I got some ideas for what I want to put in mind now that I've got my uh gbt 07 well my first box of that in so i'm excited to pimp that deck out but Wait, that's pretty much my yet yeah i did this morning and would you get any good pulls well i got that uh hyako for you oh yes thank you <laughs> yeah and then uh i got a chrono fang tiger and I didn't get a ton of great stuff, but I got a lot of commons and rares that I wanted for my decks. 
Well, you got in. You got that uh, Gr Gergwit, didn't you? Oh yeah, that's true. I did. I completely yeah. forgot about that. That's that that's like, like thirty five bucks card? right there. No, no, not anymore. It's not. Yeah. It went. The SGR was ninety before the set came out, but that always happens with uh, the secondary market, which we will be talking about later. So, um, a lot of times, what happens is like after right after the pre release, all of the cards will be super expensive, and then as soon as the set actually comes out. Uh, when more packs are in circulation, everything will tank and like settle around a, a lot lower of a price range. So mm. the GR, I believe, is sitting at like thirty five forty right now, and That's the SGR exactly. is forty forty five, I believe. Uh, yep. That's exactly it. Yep. I know my stuff. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Even though you called Vanguard a children's game, and I literally have seen maybe four children actually play Vanguard, so it's an it's an inside thing you it's a children's card game well technically the cards are small sized so it is a children's card game what while with with uh magic the gathering and why schwartz all of the cards are standard size so it's a big boy card game that is Mm -hmm. not how it works but it's kind of how it works (laughs) oh goodness gracious well whatever um so Jack, did you have any pulls? Have you gotten any packs recently? Um, I I haven't bought any packs of Vanguard. I bought DBZ uh, DBZ packs. If you want to hear about that, no, probably not. Like Dragon Ball <laughs> Zarbage. I, I I still like have not watched any Dragon Ball Z. That's probably gonna be like my entire history. I'll be on my deathbed, and you'll be like. Here, it's watch so one good. episode of DBZ, and I'm like, I've never watched any, and now you're going to ruin my streak. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we don't need, we don't need to hear about pulls from a trading card game that nobody's ever yeah. heard of outside of California, Southern California. Okay, even. Um, okay. <laughs> and then uh, other than that, I've just been trading, trying to get the rest of the cards I need for my decks. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the Bermudas set that's coming out, but I'm going to hold off on that because I think our general topic for this week is going to be uh, interesting enough and take up enough time that we don't need to, we will, we'll spend more time on Bermudas and possibly no promises yet, but that might be our next clan review just because they come out with a Bermuda set every summer. And that's going to be coming out next month, The Blessing of Divas. And um, actually, when I was talking to Joe about Bermudas and kind of like what they mean, those sets are so different from your typical release in that, you know, I don't think the Bermudas have ever had a trial deck. So you always have to buy the booster packs for if you want to build Bermudas. And they only do the half boxes, that the sort of the extra boosters or what they call now the clan booster releases. So we'll go through all of that in, in detail at a, a later time. Um, but we also had the big reveal was the set that's coming out in August, I believe. It's set eight, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And GBT08. That is like blowing people's minds with what has been revealed so far that's going to be included in that set. Um, of course, the big one for me, which has got me super hyped, is uh, they are reprinting uh, the Genesis Dragon Amnesty Messiah, which is the absolute key card that you must have if you want to play Messiahs, and it's the card that I do not have. If you um, want to play any Link Joker decks, it's uh, pretty necessary. It's it's very it's played in almost it's played in in the stride deck of every single Link Joker build yeah. because it's a good card. But to play and Messiah, it's you, re- you really need it. Oh, um, yeah. And uh, up, it's probably still now. I haven't looked um, at the trending of the cost, but ever since I've gotten back into Vanguard, that card has been $80 per card, and you need four. Um, so that's uh, $320 on, <laughs> on, on four cards. So um, I'm very excited that it's going to be reprinted in this upcoming set. And not only that, it's going to be reprinted as a rare. So it will be generally very easy to uh, acquire in this in the set eight that's coming up. What are the other clans that are going to be in set eight? Oh, it's like nine or eight different clans. 
I, I can read them all. It's a lot. Oh, and by the way, Amnesty Messiah, the GR version is now at a around fifty to fifty-five dollars. So price has already dropped. Yeah, exactly. Even though we don't get the reprint for another two months, I believe. Yeah, August. So Yeah. So two months and it's already fifty it's already down like thirty to forty dollars. Oh, I can't wait though. I can't wait. <laughs> so what are the other clans that are gonna be in set eight? It's uh, so it's called G Booster Set Eight Absolute Judgment. Yes, and so it has Royal Paladin, Neo Nectar, Genesis Gold Paladin, Link Joker, Dark Irregulars, Pale Moon, and Grand Blue. And then those additional Cray Elementals, which I don't think we've had any reveals on yet. So no, there's been only a couple of reveals for the the set so far. I the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11 cards and not all of them even have their effects revealed yet yeah there's gonna so. be a genesis dragon flagiolet messiah which the art looks real cool but nobody knows what it does interesting so and then there's some support for deleters as well nice because i want to play them too i want to basically play all the link jokers yeah deleters are you might want to get on those uh deleter strides because they're starting to go up in price well uh, all, all right. Um, <laughs> Dag nabbit. Everything goes up in price, right? Well, I don't have any money. <laughs> but um, we're going to talk about things going down in price. So basically, and up in I, I think we're going to. It's going to be a little bit of both. I believe a little bit of both. Uh, all right. So um, when they announced the reprint of Genesis Dragon Amnesty Messiah. Um, if, if you're not on the Facebooks or generally on the internet discussion boards about Vanguard, um, what you missed was a huge outcry by some of the people complaining that Bushiroad had just robbed them because that high-value card that they were holding on to as a, an investment vehicle um, was now going to drop in p- price significantly since it was going to be, you know, supply and demand. There's more supply of that particular card, and so the price will go down. Um, and there were other people who were celebrating because it is uh, an ongoing recognition uh, that Boucherode is trying to keep those uh, the the secondary market in control. So when they see that higher priced card. They put it in as a special reprint, as a rare, so that it will force the price down and get it back into the hands of people so that people can actually play the game and enjoy playing the game. Do you think that's a, an accurate summary? Um, I think it's fairly accurate summary, but I think like what I more am focused on is like how violently reactive the community and the secondary market is as a whole. So like when gbt08 like was first like announced as a set like they didn't even say well it had what had happened was it had had um the clans that were in it revealed and nothing else so what i saw someone do on one of the facebook pages was they took screenshots of the original japanese cards all the way back from when uh bt08 blue storm armada first came out and they took all of the sample images from the triple res of that set so like um whatever, uh, Ma- Glory, Ma- not Glory Maelstrom, uh, just Maelstrom, Maelstrom Dragon and some of the other cards that were in that set. They took the Japanese sample images from when a card is first revealed from that set and they posted it onto the Facebook page and said, set eight support revealed. And because people are not smart people, they see those images <laughs> and they, <laughs> they went to... they went to TCG Player, which is like the number one site where people buy cards usually. And they bought out all of the SP versions of those, every single card that was posted on the Facebook page. And like it, they were all like sitting at like a hundred dollars for like the day, a day or two because of that, that one person that decided to, to play a joke. And it wasn't even like a joke. He just posted pictures like being sarcastic and people are stupid and they jump on and buy cards because that's how the community is. And another thing, kind of more like related closely to the uh to the reprint um so when amnesty messiah got a reprint obviously like that was changing 
uh, the price of it. When I saw someone do is they took a picture of uh, Next Stage. They photoshopped that picture of Next Stage where the picture of Amnesty Dragon was uh, on that like announcement article thing. And then with like a red like paint, like the paintbrush in Microsoft Paint, they crossed out the eight and then wrote nine and then posted that. And then and then people are freaking out thinking the next stage reprint was actually confirmed. Oh, oh my gosh. which people are scared of because next stage is the next big pricey card. Yeah. So so he next stage will most likely get a reprint, I believe, in set nine. But like the thing with that is that was not confirmed whatsoever and people just jump on it. And that that price also went down to around fifty dollars for the next day or two because of that. Wow. So, so I saw first... someone. I saw someone. Someone sold a play set of Next Stages, which is an eighty to ninety dollar card right now. Someone bought that four for two hundred dollars. Well, they got a so, deal. Exactly. Um, but the the first thing that you wanted to point out was when a clan is announced to be getting support, everybody jumps on the hype train, and then all of the cards for that clan go up in price. Exactly. It's not even necessarily um the cards for that clan it's like oh here's a picture of a card art that's coming out that looks fairly similar to fenrir the genesis card so Mm -hmm. all of the fenrirs are bought out and all of fenrir support is bought out so it's like it's not necessarily the clan it's just oh this image looks like this card buy out it's like what happened with um i can't remember the specific event, but um, there was a card revealed in there was a card art revealed in the last fighters collection that looked similar to another card, and everyone started freaking out like, "Oh, this is this sub clan, blah 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 blah," and they went and bought out all the support for that card, and then it was revealed that it was just a generic stride, and then it all went back down to the original price it was at. So the the market as a whole is just very volatile and will like react to random things well foolishly. it's predictable when they announce a new set if you see something you see the clans in those set you know that those clans most likely are going to go up in price because exactly it's going to assume that the next power top tier deck is going to come based on this new set as opposed to people like us who have sworn allegiances to particular clans and we don't really ebb and flow with whatever has been released but then of course we're subject to the pain when the prices go up for the cards that we want for our clans mm-hmm. yeah um i think i think with that there's good there's good times to buy out a card and then there's like kind of foolish times to buy out a card so like the example i gave like oh we have this picture of the card buy out all of this and they don't even know what the card does so the fenrir card could get revealed and it's a terrible card and then the card will rock it down to a horrible price again and that's kind of what happened with um arboros dragon the the uh, neonectar card it was revealed that he was getting a stride there was a stride that looked like him the artwork looked like the card so the ride chain was bought out all of the support was bought out and it went up in price and it's still it's still slowly going down in price but the stride was revealed and it's not a good stride it's decent for the people that like that support, but it's not ne- it's not a good card like whatsoever. And so that 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 all that support is still starting to go down. And then like at times when a card like a set comes up start uh when a set ends up having good support for a card, like what happened with all of the uh MLB support, MLB all of the cards around MLB didn't go up in price until uh, the deck started topping in Japan, and like the the support that it got was revealed, and it was good support. Really powerful cards for the deck were revealed. That's when it went up in price. So, and that's by and, MLB. You mean Majesty Lord Blaster, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. So that's an <laughs> oak. <laughs> Major League that's Baseball. An, yes, Major League Baseball cards. Um, so when those cards went up in price, it was it was okay because. In any like market sort of thing, supply and demand exists, and the demand for these cards exists because the support is good. But when it's just false demand, because oh, this looks like this artwork, I want to buy this because uh, because artwork, and there's a demand, there's a false demand for these cards, and people will just buy them all out and then resell them for like five times the price. That is why 
the mar- the secondary market has a problem. It's not because of buyouts necessarily. It's when people go in and try and resell stuff to make a massive profit. Yeah, so so that's actually something that's relatively new is the false art. But um, one thing that I have gotten concerned about is, and, and we were having a little bit of a discussion this earlier, um, people who will trade for cards and not because they intend to play that particular clan or that particular deck, but they're trading for cards just so that they can build a deck to sell, right? That they mm-hmm. have identified that a particular build is going to be valuable in the near future. So um, they'll trade out some, you know, they'll, they'll do those trades where it's like they know a little bit more than the person that they're trading with so that they make a trade that where the value is in their favor. But it's not even so that they can play the deck. It's just so that they can sell that card later. And that bothers me because, to me, the spirit of the trade is um, that you're, you know, like helping a friend out and giving them access to a card. And, you know, some t- like like between us, right, or among us, because there's three of us, um, we'll trade and it's like sometimes we'll give out cards that are really, really good. And, you know, and then, you know, at other times, like, Jack, you'll send me something that's good, or Cole, you'll send me that's something that's good because we know which clans we all play, and yeah. so we support each other. And I don't ever have any intent of like selling those cards that you guys traded to me because I'm going to use those cards. If I'm not using them, then I'm going to store them. But like people who just trade just so that they can build sets to sell, that just it just gives me like a, a bad taste in my mouth. Um, it seems like a little bit dishonest. I mean, obviously, it's there's no law against it or anything. But to me, it kind of when you trade for cards, it implies that you're going to use that card to play the game. Um, and if you're just going to use that card to generate profit for yourself, well, then I'd rather trade that card to somebody else who's actually going to play the card. You know? Um, mm-hmm. I mean, when it's like a fair trade, like when you're yes, when you're giving the card to someone like for them to use it, or you're like you're like taking a hit, like say the card values are not equal whatsoever, but they're like, Oh, they really need this card then. And then they go and uh, sell the card. That's different. But I feel like if you're getting like value out of the trade and you don't need the card, I don't necessarily see the harm in it, but I definitely see where you're coming from with that. So Cole, have you ever um, bought a really expensive card online (laughs) or in person? Yeah. And that would be the one copy of, Super Cosmic Hero Grand Gallop, and I need two more. And I'm kind of debating on if I even want to play Grand Gallop because that is an expensive card. How much has it gotten up to? It's about 30, 27 to $30 last time I checked. And that was just in the most recent set? Uh, no, actually, that's from uh, the Dimension, uh, Dimension Police uh, Clan Booster. So that's almost, it's almost a year old, I think, now. And that card is still $30. Uh, the Stride, Break Stride or whatever uh, people are calling it now, is uh, Xcal. And that's actually gone down. I think it was like $9 last time I checked. So that's not bad. Yeah, so is there a concern in, in Vanguard that card prices, in order to even build a somewhat viable deck, are, are getting too high? Yeah. Um, I think that's definitely a problem, and it's been a problem for a while. Like, when the f- game first started out, that wasn't really a problem. But now, like, I think especially with how, like, the secondary market acts so violently and reactively, it kind of leads to a lot of cards being more expensive than they should be. Like, if you want to build a Fenrir Genesis deck, you were going to build it for fun. Uh, just because you like the artwork or you like how Genesis works and it's not necessarily a competitive deck. And we still don't know that it will ever be a competitive deck. So even still, if you want to build it for fun now, you still have to pay $15, 20 for the Fenrirs because someone decided to go and buy them out because this artwork looks like Fenrir. And Fenrir is getting support. I don't know how good the support is going to be. It could be really bad but I'm still going to buy out all the Fenrir's and hope to make a profit. And that's the problem is people are trying to make a profit off of this game that people are, there's people trying to make a profit off of 
a game that a lot of people are treating as their hobby and they're doing it for fun. Yeah, it's supposed to be fun. Remember that? Exactly. <laughs> Remember how like opening packs is supposed to be like exciting because then you get like this special card and you're like, oh boy, I can put that in my deck. Um, not like, oh, I have to invest in order just to be able to play and have fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, I mean, that's about, so I, I mean, I, I have to admit, right? I've spent over over a hundred dollars just when i was starting out to get my four battle sister coco's and my four silent toms now luckily you know coco will always be useful and silent tom will always be useful so it's not it's not you know that bad of a deal and and also the fact you know i know silent tom did have a reprint but honestly the art and everything on the original is so much nicer then what and then in that reprint? case, yeah, and then in that case, too, the reprint is still the same price as the original because it's been so long since the reprint. Yeah, it's been even since that reprint. Yeah, exactly. So talking about reprints and how they affect the price of things, I know that in Magic the Gathering, they have a publicly published list of cards that they will never reprint called the reserved list. And Magic has the intent that when they put something on that list, they are recognizing that uh, Magic cards are collectibles, and they actually want the cards to go up in price. Now, I know that there are several formats for Magic um, where you know you can do different builds and have d- different cards from different generations and stuff in those builds, but sort of the like you're a real magic player type builds require that you have these more expensive cards, but having that reserved list is definitely going to drive up the price of cards that they, you know, will never ever get reprinted. And so if that card is needed for your deck, you're going to pay through the nose. Um, My hope is that Boucher road never does a reserved list for Vanguard and that any card ever is always open for reprint. Well, I think the thing with that is magic community is the magic community and the um, Vanguard community are two very, very different communities. Like Vanguard's been around for what? Five years. Five, six years at the most. More like magic's been around for, yeah, yeah, (laughs) magic's magic's been around for over 20 years. And like the community as a whole is um, it's targeted much more towards an adult audience and a very collectible audience like there's cards in that game that are thousands of dollars to mm-hmm. acquire them well and, but they're thousands of dollars because of this reserve list and to kind of counter argue you uh the reserve list came out like two or three years after magic started it, it wasn't it wasn't 10 years after i i understand that but like my my whole point is like with um I, I I just think their target their their target audience are two very different. Uh, there's they're two very different things. I I get I kind of forget the point I was trying to make because. <laughs> so, but so yeah, you, you just think that that magic is targeted more towards uh, established adults who have plenty I don't, of discretionary income. It's not necessarily the income part. It's more of like I feel like magic is more of a collect like it's more of a collection. It's been around i i really don't remember the point i was trying to make here i apologize <laughs> uh, that's all right <laughs> i mean well yes they 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 do publicly say that they have made the reserve list because they want magic cards to be collectibles and so for them to have real value where that value will never be reduced by uh the fact of a reprint where it it's really clear that um vanguard has a uh, a a, a commitment or a beginning commitment to do reprints and they've done reprints. I know, especially for me, Oracle think tank, because there are like different sets where I have cards from different sets and they're the same card because they've decided to reprint those cards to make them accessible to people. Um, so Cole, in your experience with Yu-Gi-Oh, cause I think that's where you have a lot of background. Um, yeah. How do they handle reprints? Uh, they reprints are a big thing in Yu-Gi-Oh. So, like most of your staple cards that go in most any deck, um, have been reprinted probably six or seven times already. 
uh, which is kind of crazy because there are some versions of it that are worth some money and there are others that are just commons in the set and they're worth less than pennies. Uh, it's uh, like, uh, let's see, um, Mystical Space Typhoon. I remember when that was, uh, before they started to reprint, that card was, I think, like $10. And all it is is you, you can play it from your hand or on the field and it uh, destroys one face up or not face up one uh, spell or trap card on the field that's it and it's a pretty it's a really good card and uh that's been reprinted in the i think it was wing raiders earlier this year uh, as a common and there i have so many of those where before i was just struggling to get uh, a, a play set of three and now i've got like 30 of them so i think that's uh that's pretty crazy because Yu-Gi-Oh does not have the. They they're not afraid to reprint cards and make them more accessible for uh, people. Well, I like, think the whole. Sorry, continue. I was gonna say I think the whole reason that they do that is just because that they're, they're targeting a younger audience. No, Yu-Gi-Oh definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I think I think the thing with Yu-Gi-Oh though is that like they'll they have entire sets that are dedicated to reprinting expensive yeah. cards, and then everyone's like. And then everyone's like, "Oh, these are the best cards. I need. I need to buy this set." So that set, Konami sells so much of that set, and then come around the next ban list that all those decks are are hit, and then they those cards are all particularly useless in to mm-hmm. some degree. And then Konami will release, "Oh, this set, this set has this powerful card," and then that's how Konami makes its money by selling boxes and boxes and boxes. Because of the power creep in that game is so wor- is so much worse than I think any other card game really has been. Like Vanguard has power creep, but they there's decks that have lasted like for years. Like the uh, how long has uh, Shadow Paladin Abyss been a deck? It's been almost two years, I believe. In Yu Gi Oh, a deck will last for like three four months and then it's no longer competitive. Oh yeah, the ban list just. <clears throat> the ban hammer goes down and it takes probably two or three of the most important cards that that deck and then that deck is almost completely unplayable exactly so i think reprints are a good thing but not if it's done in that degree where oh everything's reprinted and then it's all useless now so yeah. i kind of like how bushy road is they'll reprint stuff every once in a while and it'll make it like so like the I forget what the card like. The most recent one, there was a dark irregular that was just reprinted in this Thruster. set. Yeah, Doreen was uh, starting to go up in price, and Bushy Road's like, "Oh, this is an important card to the dark irregular clan." So they reprinted as a rare with new artwork. So those people that still have it still retains the value of the old ones because they're double rare or triple rare or whatever the rarity is, and it's a different artwork. While the new one is a rare and it's different artwork from the old one. So if you don't care about uh, like the having max rarity decks you can have you have access to the new one but the old one is still retains some value Dude, the same thing if, happened if your deck is sorry. not blinged out i don't want to play against you <laughs> um what are you wait you're waiting for for what are those the the rare amnesty messiahs uh, not the they'll still sparkle the, man <laughs> not the sgr amnesty messiahs they, they will they will still sparkle so I expect you now to get the $130 uh, Amnesty Messiahs. Oh. So uh, also another aspect to this, which um, I wasn't even thinking about, is so Pokemon is is very strict that every year they, they have a rotation and they rotate mm-hmm. sets, previous sets out. And the way that they use reprints, and they have two ways of reprints. One is just a flat, the card is reprinted um, as a, a common or a, a rare or an ultra rare. Um, or they will reprint a card as a secret rare. Um, and then if it's reprinted in any way, shape or form, then it, you know, may last out through a rotation where everything else where it was originally printed will get rotated out. Um, so that's an interesting scheme because if they reprint something as a common and they keep it in the format past a rotation, it doesn't really change the value of that card, but if they reprint something as a secret rare that was a high value card, it'll still maintain past the rotation, and it will maintain its value. 
So it's interesting that Pokemon has like some more levers on controlling the value of the cards through rotations because you know the rotation once your cards are rotated out well except for now that they do the expanded format but still yeah once your cards are rotated out that's it they they have zero value whatsoever except to like really weird collectors who want cards with no value um and i was thinking that uh that vanguard also has a little bit of a lever on this because uh, you know, as we were discussing earlier this week, I was I was recently hit by this because uh, I kind of want to make a Sukiyomi build, and I have the God Hawk Ichibyoshi Grade Zero. I have four of the Grade Ones. I have one of the Grade Twos, and I have none of the Grade Threes. So I was looking at the prices online, and the Grade Threes are all like six or seven dollars each and the grade twos are all 16 or 17 dollars each so i was asking jack i was like why are the grade threes which are you know whatever the higher value cards or the more rarity uh less expensive than the grade twos and jack explained that they actually reprinted the grade threes but they never reprinted the grade twos at all so that so they've maintained sort of the the cost value of the Sukiyomi build because you you know what's the point of playing Sukiyomi grade three if you don't have Sukiyomi grade two <laughs> at all? Um, so they've maintained sort of the cost of that the entirety of that build uh, and the higher price of it while still allowing for a reprint of the grade three, which was uh, I guess it was just a harder to get card because originally it was a triple rare. Well, they were both triple rare in the BTO three or whatever set they came out in. It's just in the first fighters collection the grade three Tsukiyomi got a reprint and then nothing else got a re the nothing else in the ride chain got a reprint. Yeah. But those, I mean, I've got six of those grade ones. So everybody, yeah, that's, it. yeah, that's not a huge deal, but like the more important, like the grade three got a reprint, the grade two did grade two didn't. And the price is still, well, $16. I think $16 is the right place for a valuable Vanguard card to be. I well, and that's, that's what it was in, and that's what it was in like the older state of the game. But like more recently, like all of these cards have been going up. Like to have a competitive deck, like like take example my no seal deck that I I tra- I was like very fortunate to get a hold of because I I found some good trades because I really wanted to play Angel Feathers. Almost every single card in that deck, including commons, is two dollar like. Almost every single common card in that deck is two dollars. So it's I have like like a couple of rares that are like seven each. Um and then the Sukio or that's not the Sukiomi, the no seal cards themselves are worth like uh twenty for the grade two and then thirty for the grade three or grade one. Well, I'm I hope we make someday get back to a day where sixteen dollars is the is the key point. The one thing that I'm afraid of with this is that there are people, and I think it's, I would say, more people online than in person who are buying and reselling Vanguard cards, but they aren't players. And they're mm-hmm. actually creating this artificial secondary market for the cards that they somehow, you know, they identify which are going to be the high value cards and then they drive up the price, which is what happens in the free market that's <laughs> that's the way a uh a volatile asset will work when there's scarcity the price goes up supply right, so, and demand yeah i think that's our our discussion of of the secondary market and reprints and and all that at least for this time around we'll probably come back to it again when there is another uproar in the community about cards and reprints uh so cole do you have anything else you wanted to say about this uh it ain't cheap to play a card game it ain't cheap to play any card game any not even any my little pony is an expensive card game to play uh oh oh well we've all got our (laughs) hobbies jack anything any last words secondary market is 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 bad in this game particularly (laughs) but um i think i think like once people like realize how how bad it is and like how violently everyone reacts and like if they kind of step away from that 
it'll get a lot better because you see all these Facebook posts like, oh, why is this card suddenly so expensive? Blah, blah, blah. It's not necessarily that the card is expensive. It's that people buy out all of the cards and then try and sell them for five times the price. And then once a person buys in, if someone who's ignorant and like doesn't necessarily like check up on the Facebook posts and everything, if they see that this card is expensive and they're like, oh, I better buy this. If, as soon as someone buys a card at that high price, that is the set price. And they realize, oh, I can sell this card for $90 instead of the 10 it was at before. And so it stays at that price. So like once people realize that and they stop buying cards when they get so ridiculously expensive, the, the secondary market will balance out more. Well, hopefully. And one thing hopefully. I... Um... One other thing that I had been thinking about was in uh, in the magic community, there's uh, something called Puka Trade, where it's solely trade, no cash. And based on your trades, you build up points, and then you spend those points to get trade cards with other people. So it's really like sort of eviscerating that secondary market by the people who want to participate in this way, because they'll just, you know... You can do a number of lower value trades with people you don't know, right? It's almost like the trading that you would do in the card shop and then get a higher value card because you built up all of these trade points by making the lower value trades with other people. So I you know, would like to see that spread to more card games to make that more accessible because I think in the Vanguard community, that would work really, really well. Because there's always mm-hmm. going to be somebody who's going to build, have a buildup of clan stuff for clans that they have absolutely no interest. I, I have more shallow, shadow paladins than I ever want to see in my entire life. I will never <laughs> use them. If I could trade them to some rando on the internet, get a bunch of points for that, and then use those points to get something for like a Starvader build or a Deleter build, then that would be great. I'd be like super pumped for that. Um, so that's those are my last words. Uh, our term for the week is persona flip with a bunch of garbage <laughs> on our sheet because somebody mistyped <laughs> after the word persona flip. So, uh, Cole, what is a persona flip? What have we decided that a persona flip is? A persona flip we have decided is, um, when a stride, uh, as part of its cost requires you to flip over a, I believe we're going to go with a specific named uh stride it's like it's uh, well it's a copy of itself yeah yeah well i was i was going to include uh uh your excelix and amnesty too Uh, but i I guess that probably wouldn't work no that's it's not it's i mean i can't it kind of relates into what we're discussing here because like the whole reason we chose persona flip is because that's the reason that amnesty messiah and chrono dragon next stage and um olivia the bermuda triangle were all so expensive in the first place is that you needed multiple copies of them to uh to activate their skills and so that's why those cards as grs which were only i believe two per case of booster boxes that's the reason they got so expensive in the first place was because the fact that the demand for them was so high because each person that wanted to play this great card needed at least two copies most of the time four copies of the card and so Bushy Road has like had like said that there was a mistake. And so that's why the GRs now you see they're not as expensive because you don't need more than one copy of them if you can only afford one copy of them. Yeah. So the, the, instead of a persona flip, it will ask for you to flip up any card in the G zone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Or so. even it's in like the Kagura one's a G guardian in this set, which is never like obviously we haven't had g guardians before but it's always been a stride that required you to flip up another copy of itself until last set where um alt mile didn't have that and asha didn't have that and now gurgwit doesn't have that so like bushy road promised they're moving away from having grs with persona flips yeah and and just to be clear amnesty uh amnesty messiah does not require a persona flip exelix messiah which is from the set five uh moonlit dragon fang requires that you have first it requires that you have an amnesty messiah face up before you can even use exelix messiah and then to use exelix messiah you have to face up another amnesty messiah exactly so So you need multiple copies of amnesty to play that's the it's not necessarily the the persona flip that makes them expensive 
That's just specifically what happened with Olivia and Next Age. And then Exelix is what made Amnesty expensive because you need multiple copies of Amnesty for Exelix. Yeah, and the reason that it's sort of a gameplay reason why you would include a Persona flip is it limits the number of times that you can use a ability or a card's ability without limiting the number that you can have in the deck. So you it keeps it, you know, you can have four copies of any card, but hey, Nebula Dragon, Big Crunch Dragon, you have to Persona Flip just to use it. So you're only going to be able to use its ability twice. Um, exactly. And but having... that's not a, that's a, that's a triple rare so that you, it's more accessible. There's more, there's more copies of Big Crunch Dragon in circulation, which is why it settles around $20 at its most expensive because yeah. there's so many of them in circulation compared to Amnesty Messiah or Next Stage. And also, um, I just realized the GRs weren't always like persona flipping strides. Like there've been there have been other GRs that are not nearly as expensive as Next Stage or Amnesty because they're just cards that go by themselves and like don't require anything else. Yeah. And uh just also on on the gameplay side, the when I was talking about limiting the number of times you play it. Exelix Messiah can only be played three times. So they, they did that by linking it to Amnesty Messiah that way. So you can have four Amnesty Messiahs in your G, G deck. It would be useless to have four Exelix Messiahs in your uh, G deck because you'll never be able to use that fourth one. Um, all right, so that's everything that we have for this week. Uh, just ask again, as I do every week, because we need more reviews in iTunes. Please give us a review in iTunes. I would, I would uh, greatly appreciate it. Maybe, maybe when we get to episode twenty, we'll have a contest for everybody who has reviewed us in iTunes up to that point in time. Um, I'll send you a signed comment or something. <laughs> 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 we'll all sign a comment uh, when we're at Gen Con. So it looks like we're all going to be at Gen Con. So if anybody's going to be coming to Gen Con, uh, you'll have an opportunity to meet up with us, play some Vanguard, probably um, just have fun in general. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to our friend, SBJ, who helps us out in keeping this podcast going. And to thanks to Nick Burgess for the intro and outro music that we use. And the best way to reach us is still on Twitter. Uh, so our main for the podcast is uh, at drive underscore check. And then if you want to reach me directly, I'm at wash in the sink, W-A-S-H-I-N-T-H-E-S-I-N-K. I am at Cole underscore McCune. at C-O-L-E underscore M-C-C-U-N-E. And I am at Drive underscore Jack. Uh, thank you guys for listening to this week's episode of the Drive Check podcast. And Merry Christmas, you filthy animals. What is that even from? Home Alone. Oh, wow. Oh, that... It's a classic. It does not hold up. It doesn't hold up, you're correct.